great. I can see hundreds of people moving into the area, so take your seats, please. We're about to start this session. Great. So our session today is entitled The Business of News in an Era of Deception. And my guest is one of the best-placed, most interesting individuals to discuss this with. So trust, transparency, and privacy have never been more topical, and for a very good reason. Last month, the European Union formalized the General Data Protection Regulation, creating a global conversation around the protection of personal information. GDPR has ignited a pivot across our industry, driven by renewed focus on truth, authentic authenticity, and responsibility for us all. And just last week, the FBI probes media training practices in the US. And a bill tabled in California just this week could see GDPR laws in the US pretty quickly. But this time last year, Cairns was the stage for some very honest introspection from our own industry, which saw us all reprioritize the entire spectrum of diversity and inclusion and our need to make changes. So today, I have the pleasure of talking with Mark Thompson, the CEO and president of the New York Times Company. And since 2012, Mark has been leading the company's strategy, operations, and business units. In six years, Mark has made more changes, this is my estimation, to the brands over its 170-year history. And many of them, I would say the majority of them, have paid off, and that's what we're going to be talking about. He has taken risks that have impacted thousands beyond the pages of the Times, in doing so, setting new benchmarks for the news in this era of transformation. Could we play the video? Welcome. Thank you so much for being here, Mark. Hi, Ruth. Hi. 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 So over the next 30 minutes, um, we're going to be discussing broadly the role of truth, authenticity in the business of transformation of the news. So as well as responsibility that we collectively have in protecting privacy of the people we work with and the people that we are. So um, it's so amazing to have you here and it's really refreshing to have you here to talk to us about what you're doing with the New York Times. And um, I'm going to ask you some questions that are very, very relevant to our industry. But first of all, we'd love to hear a little bit of your story, specifically from the BBC to the Times. Yeah, and, and I, I want to say from, from, from uh, uh, TV and broadcasting into uh, a kind of classic newspaper-led tr tradition. So my story, I... I started off as a, as a kind of baby recruit at the BBC a long time ago, became a, a journalist and, and worked in uh, TV news and current affairs uh, uh, for the BBC, then kind of moved, uh, it's still into creative roles, but like running uh, networks for the BBC and then eventually sort of becoming that, that splendid thing, a media executive, I became the head of BBC television, running the, the TV operations of the BBC, then I became... CEO of Channel 4 in the UK, went back to the BBC as, as, as Director General, which means CEO and Editor-in-Chief, and then in 2012 moved across the Atlantic to the, to the, to the New York Times. So that, that's my story. It's a big move, an Englishman running an iconic American well, brand. Uh, but actually, I think the funny thing is that, the, although that's true, I think the fact, uh, the, the oddity for the Times 
is they'd always had chief executives who came from the business side. They'd worked in, in sales or whatever. Having a, having a chief executive who was also a journalist uh, and from the creative side was a new thought. And I think if you talk to my colleagues, they would kind of grudgingly accept it's probably worked out quite well. But that was the, the really big shock was having someone who'd been... I'd, I'd, I'd been an editor-in-chief for the previous 10 years before I came to the Times. That's not my job anymore. But, but I, I've kind of, that's my background, really, is, is making editorial decisions. So when you started uh, in 2012, it was a little bit of a different world. Um, the universal access to technology that we all have has transformed our businesses, respective businesses. Um, and as a business, we've witnessed an entire uh, re-engineering of our ecosystem, most significantly, I'd say, past three or four years. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that and the implications. But you were quoted as saying, trust the audience and build your business model with the belief that quality news is a quality product that people will want to ultimately pay for. Yeah, so that, that, that's our bet. And, you know, I, I always say if, if our bet is wrong... Like we're screwed, <laughs> you know, we haven't got, we haven't got. There is no plan B. It, we, so, uh, so we have, we have faith that there are not everyone. I'm not suggesting everyone, but there are lots of thoughtful people out there who are intrigued, but often also puzzled and frightened about the 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 the, the, the disruption that the world's going through, yeah. and who want the tools and the information with which to make up their own mind about what's happening, and that that demand is going to grow, not diminish. And in a weird way, you know, don't be like a traditional newspaper trying to cheese pair mm. and cut your newsroom because like, the economics are very difficult now. Be, be Reed Hastings and, and pour investment and money into great content. Yeah. Do your best in trying to figure out the right digital way of getting that content to, to, to your audiences and think about engagement and monetization and all that stuff. But actually the heart of it is great content, an audience who wants it. And in, I always say to my colleagues, if we can get the content and the audiences together, we can, the rest is kind of trivial. We can fig figure out the rest. Well, it was a pretty good bet. 2.8 million subscribers, digital subscribers, which is more than any of your peers set. Yeah, and I, I want to say, in the absolute peak, uh, the actual glory days of the New York Times as a physical newspaper, uh, w it, we had about 1.8 million subscribers yeah. in the kind of late 80s, early 90s. Now, we've still got a million subscribers, so we're, we're, we're getting close to 4 million subscribers, so wow. twice as many as the absolute pinnacle of, uh, of, of print. So that leads me to this question. What is your view on access to content? I mean, you're talking about paid for and distribution of content. And, I mean, it's transformed the news business, especially when we look at, you know, the competitive nature of some of the large distribution platforms and their focus on news. Well, I want to say, I mean, firstly, we want our news content to be widely influential around the world. Yeah. And we want to give very broad access to citizens in America and the world to our, our, our content. We have about 140 million uniques a month, about 100 in the US, about, about 40 uh, beyond the US. Not quite what you think. In, of that 100 million in the US, 34 million, last time I looked, were millennials. It's a, it's yeah. a, this is a much younger audience on average than the TV or radio yeah. audience for news. So it's, it, it, uh, it's uh, younger than, by the way, some big internet sites as well. So it's not quite what you think. 140 million uniques, 4 million subscribers. That means we've got 136 million uniques of people who are not subscribers who are looking at our content. Yeah. So our theory has been be quite porous. Let a lot of people see a lot of your journalism before you get them to pay and try and be smart about how you draw them in, engage them, and progressively... Uh, convince them of the of the merits of, of, of becoming a paid subscriber. So w we are subscription first, but it's kind of, it's subscription and free. Yeah. And with the idea of a big funnel with a big lip, big wide lip, so as many people are bumping into you as possible. So let me, let me just sort of put it out there. The, you mentioned the millennials. You, 
and I'll get back to that. But the New York Times publishes around 200 pieces of journalism every day, probably more, and this includes some of the best work published anywhere in the world. Um, you have successfully launched The Daily, a podcast, which, yeah. you know, you talked about millennials and the yeah. appeal to millennials, obviously, is along the lines that the podcast has been successful in delivering. You've also said that you've been able to successfully demonstrate an ability to translate the quality and the authority and yeah. the humanity of the times um, into audio, which is uh, pretty difficult to succeed with. But now you're launching... The weekly? Am I allowed to talk about that? Yeah, sure. No, no, so we, we, we've uh, uh, we've sold a, a weekly TV show to uh, a combination of uh, uh, FX and Hulu in the states. It's, it's actually we think it's the first show which is a collaboration between a, a cable channel with digital assets, but also a streaming service. So it'll launch at you know probably like say ten o'clock at night, nine o'clock at night on a Sunday on yeah. FX, but by midnight it'll be streaming on Hulu as well. And, and by the way, that's one of one. We've got another great uh, show that we're, we, we've um, sold, which is uh, Overlooked, which is going to be a series of documents. Overlooked is a, a, a great initiative by our Obit team. Yeah. They've gone back over the whole history of the Times, and, they, and they've been doing Obits of the women who were overlooked, who were forgotten, the women whose, whose, whose achievements didn't make it into the pages of the Times, and that. so the and by the way, this is people like you know Charlotte Bronte yeah. and, and Emily Dickinson. I mean, the, these are some of these women are people you've never heard of. Some of them are your jaw drops that they, they didn't get the attention at the time. And essentially, there's going to be a series of documentaries with absolutely top uh, women directors uh, and That's women amazing. stars, each of which is going to. Focus on one of these women. So, Can't so, believe so how there's happy multiple. That makes we, we, we expect multiple TV shows coming. That's uh, fantastic. So, so it's sort of a related question. I mean, I'm, I mean, getting getting the message out to millions. I mean, I guess with Hulu, you'll reach an extra 90 million Americans or something along those lines. But how do you manage your relationships with Facebook and Google? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's great. It's so know. good. Uh, um, <laughs> So the, the really interesting thing is, it's always, in our experience, it'd be kind of intriguing to hear from other people here, it's moving the whole time. Yeah. Uh, I would say right now that um, uh, our relationship with Google, I would say, is a sophisticated uh, relationship. Google has tangibly listened to some of our concerns and met them. They used to insist that uh, on Google search, any user of Google should be able to look at three stories for nothing, e uh, all you know, every day, every three stories a day, for, as it were, with no 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 subscription model or whatever, to, to, so the Google experience was good. And if you didn't do that, they they pushed you all the way down their ranking. Yes, we're very now, familiar with that model. Now <laughs> they now they've agreed to implement our pay model. Oh, so, really? so inside the Google environment, yeah. uh, we've got a five-story a, 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 a week uh, limit. They, they do, they're making it easier to subscribe through subscribe with Google. So I would say at the moment, um, I think net net, w uh, uh, we feel that although there's you know we've got a long list of more things we'd love to talk to Google about, actually it's it's a genuinely quite creative, quite positive environment. Facebook, by contrast, and I've been public about this, we found very difficult. And I'll, I'll just give you one example. Uh, Facebook, as you may possibly have heard, is under some pressure around political advocacy. Uh, and they, they, they're implementing a plan um, uh, which essentially is to label political advocacy. But they've also decided that they want to label news and put news essentially currently in the same archive. They, the archive was originally going to be political ads and they you know said do you mind if all of your marketing goes goes into the political ads archive and is labeled political advertising to which our answer is actually we do mind yes but the other week um we had an ad they've now got a, they've now got an archive public archive which is ads with political content and you know last week we had an ad for myt cooking our cooking pro product it was a it was dangerous stuff. It was a recipe for a pistachio and rose water semolina cake. <laughs> My God. And uh, as I've said, it may contain nuts, but it does not contain <laughs> political content. It's a sort of, and it yeah, went in there. Straight into the archive, yeah. Straight I mean, it's a journey. Archive. It's a journey, I expect. And, and, and 
I, I want to say, you know, uh, our experience, we have lots of nice meetings with our kind of partnership people, but, but we, we don't have the same sense of a dialogue that we do with Google. I, I think Twitter is very, Twitter's becoming a very, I think, an exciting and interesting platform again. And we, we're, we're very, we have very promising conversations with Twitter. So uh, our experience is, it's like the weather changes, and yeah. that's, the, that's my current weather report, really. Well, this has actually been the topic of many of the meetings we've had over the last 24 hours, I would say. Um, so you're not alone. Um, I wanted to talk to you then... If I may say so, yeah. the, the fundamental issue is, I would say, not just us, but citizens mm -hmm. have too little transparency about how choices are made. There are, are incredibly complex algorithms which are changing, optimising and changing the whole time, which neither the marketing industry nor publishers nor the public uh, 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 have detailed understanding of. And, you know, we, we constantly hear about good intentions from all of the platforms. Mm. I do think this is a moment where, one way or another, whether it's voluntary or whether it's through regulation, we actually have a statutory or a kind of, we absolutely understand exactly how these things are working. So this morning we had the same question with Facebook and Google about do you think that the public understand what they're actually signing up for or opting out of? And it was very interesting to hear Facebook said, we don't think they really understand what they're do doing. Google was very confident that the public really do know what they're opting out of and asking for. What do you think? So uh, I, I think that in broad terms, I mean, the, uh, I, mean uh, I would say about myself, I, I don't read the, uh, the, these, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of the, 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 the click yeah. here sort of, you know, these are our rules. And I don't read them in detail. I do, obviously, I think most people understand at a common sense level that there's a barter that, yeah. that I'm going to be giving my attention and giving my data in return for valuable services. Uh, um, my issue is that, that some people sometimes think that because this is a barter market... It can't be distorted. You're not, you know, consumers aren't paying in anything, so therefore there can't be market distortion. Actually, that's not true. Barter markets can suffer from market failure, market dominance, exactly. price gouging. Because yes. it is, a, you know, the data's worth something. Yeah. Our industries, all of our industries, actually, in many ways, are based on these things, on attention and data. They have, in the end, a financial value, and you can get market distortion. And I think. It's time the regulators, the competition regulators, I'm not sure they have to change the law. They have to start looking at whether these markets are working effectively for the public yeah. in respect to their data, First but also foremost. for the advertising yep. industry and for publishers. So let's talk a little bit more about digital marketing. You guys have shone uh, a light on some of the questionable practices, and I mean as a public forum yeah. in the paper, yeah. um, involving several prominent distribution platforms, and it was a very clear, concise review of yeah. what was going on, um, you know, in how they're managing the flow and the authenticity of the content that yeah. they were publishing. So this place sort of needs to be cleaned up a little bit. And we all it, it, agree well, with that. I, I, I think we do. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's almost like, I mean, I'm sure there are similarly, there are bad actors and there are bad practices. Yeah. I want to say more generally, we've all end up, we've all ended up to a lesser extent feeling we've got to participate in a really messed up environment. Yeah. We have no choice. So that brings me to the prevalence of machine learning and AI. Many of the, many of the sessions um, in Cannes this week are focusing on these two areas, related areas. I, I was recently in the, in the Vatican and I was introduced what? to the Vatican's head of blockchain and machine learning. What? <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was wearing a habit, by the way. But that's oh, my story. God. No, uh, and by the way, the real thing, he's, he, you know, he's working with uh, MIT Media Lab and all of it. Oh, but uh, the, Vatican, the Vatican's got an, uh, an ML and blockchain guy. That's amazing. <laughs> so There's a guy, by the way. So, you know, machine learning has created some pros and cons for us in our business. I mean, machine learning and automation is pretty ubiquitous across all of our competitive set, everything we do. So the pros for us... Um, in marketing, media, it's about efficiency, greater time spent thinking. So if something can be automated, then it's better for everybody. The cons, we've seen exponential increase in dodgy stuff. So fraud's been happening. Um, the more we automate, the more intelligent we become, the more the bad people become intelligent and can 
slip through the cracks. In 2017, many of our clients, large MNCs, uh, reacted with their wallets, famously cutting millions of dollars from digital spend, raising the questions um, of the pervasiveness of machine-based trading, etc. So it was a revolution in our industry. It is a revolution in our industry. But what is the impact on news with AI? I mean, surely there are pros and cons that you have to think about. Yeah, and I, I want to say that, the, I mean, to state the obvious, the, the, there isn't a stop button or a rewind button here. Yeah. Uh, anything that can be done by machines is going to be done by machines sooner or later, and I'm betting on sooner. So, so, in other words, there is a reality of a very big shift. I think it's sometimes, sometimes uh, there is an exaggeration of, of how fast it's going to happen. Uh, weirdly, as people may know, um, in the 1950s and early 60s, there was an assumption that by 1970 we'd have kind of sentient robots that it was going to happen incredibly quickly. There was then an enormous gap of time where actually there was very little progress at all. Yeah. Suddenly speeded up, uh, and people think maybe it's going to happen tomorrow. It's, but there are certain tasks for which machine learning is going to become very applicable in journalism. We use um, a machine learning application to sort comments. So the first level of editorial curation, the first level, is, is machine learning, which is learned from millions of comments on the Times, and gives a, a, a probability of whether a comment's likely to be acceptable to a, a human New York Times curator, yeah. then the humans take over. But it gets, it gets 100,000 comments down to 10,000, so the humans have got a chance sort of thing. So there's lots of good applications. But I want to say that our own experience, um, we had in late 16 and early 17 lots of really stinging and brilliant editorial pieces about fake news... Yeah. We served some fake news ads next to the comments. So and the New York Times ended up with fake news ads coming, not only just filtering through the system, but right. And, and it turned out that trying to stop it was a non trivial task. You know, you talk to Google about DFP and say, well, what can we do? Yeah. And it, 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 the further you go into it, the further our powerlessness. And we found, we found ways of stopping it, but it was an immensely difficult task, and not, well, not one where we can be sure. We're looking now the whole time to make sure that we're not letting bad ads through the system. It's a, it's a full-time job. Yeah. And I met, we, we talked about this very briefly, but the MIT study that was released in April about... It, it's the most comprehensive study on fake news ever, ever done on, since Twitter's inception all the way through to today. Well, April. And... Um, I mean, it's, a, it's, it's quite a comprehensive look at fake news, but we're not going to talk too much about that, except for the fact that humans are more drawn to the fake news than they are to really impactful stories that are, are true. And this is human nature. We're, we're, more, we're more drawn to sure, no, terrible well, we, things. It, 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 if, you think about, if you think about fake news, it's got some great qualities to it. Uh, it doesn't cost much to make because you don't have to. You, you don't. You can make it up. You don't have to go out and report it. Yeah. And secondly, you can choose like re really popular subjects. You, you're not limited to what's happened. You can find out yep. what are the most popular kinds of story, and you can find that out by the way. You know, in a kind of systematic machine-led uh, uh, way, and then you, you make you make sure your stories are like, the most popular ones. So. It's not surprising in a way. I mean, fantasy is more popular of than reality. You know, <laughs> Hollywood movies are more yeah. popular than documentaries. So I shouldn't surprise us uh, that that's the case. And I, I want to say the most important thing for me is that users, end users, are able, are given the help they need in terms of the signals and cues so they can make up their own mind. Yeah. And actually, I'm kind of scared of thinking that actually... All that needs to happen is Google and Facebook tweak their algorithms and the fake news doesn't get through. Uh, we, the, you know, people are allowed to make stuff up and they're allowed to have satire, which isn't true, which exaggerates political opinions. Politicians are allowed to exaggerate and they should be. And, you know, our democracies work because all that stuff gets argued about and people make up their minds. And the most important thing is, I think, that the trouble with the big platforms is all of the things that 
help people figure this stuff out, well, not all of them, but many of the signals have been stripped away. I, I saw um, on, on my Google feed, on my, on my, uh, on my Android phone, uh, 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 on the Google feed, I saw um, uh, uh, a, a card which was, uh, it had the following, Donald Trump, big picture of Trump, headline, this snake cannot shed his skin, and bottom, New York Times. What? No. So what that was, and it's a perfectly legitimate thing, it was a Maureen Dowd column. Oh. But without either the word opinion or the name Maureen Dowd, it sounds like the New York Times has lost its, you know, all sense of, of proportion. Yeah. And it's just going out for a full personal attack on Donald Trump. And you're not. And we're not. So let me <laughs> ask you, the moral imper <laughs> imperative of the news as an incredibly important platform in everyone's lives in the wake of Me Too, data privacy, the exceptionally polarizing political climate. What is the role of the New York Times? Is it to right the wrongs or it is a platform for debate? What would you like? Well, to so, sort of so I think we're there to report what's actually happened and try and do that dispassionately and then be a platform for, in the words of Adolf Ox, who bought the newspaper in 1895, intelligent and civil debate, including views from every perspective. That's, that's what we want to do. Um, but it's interesting. There was a, if you remember, there was a wave of uh, moral panic in the mm. immediate aftermath of the US election around fake news. Yes. And then immediately, or very quickly, within a week or two, uh, President Trump actually flipping fake news and using fake news as a description for the... Um, for, for, for the, for, 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 the for, as it were, establishment media, yes. like the Times. So... By the beginning of December 16, so this is just you know, about, what, a month after the election, we were, we were being heavily attacked. Trump yeah. had, 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 uh, had, had done lots of tweets about us already, uh, the failing New York Times and all the rest of it. We had lots of defenders out there, and actually, you know, audiences were going up, subscriptions were yeah. going up. But I thought, I thought we should try and tell our own story in our own words and I, 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 there's a guy called David Rubin who's the head of brand marketing at the Times. So I got David on the phone. And I basically said, what could you do with 10 million bucks? If I can find 10 million bucks. We hadn't done brand marketing probably for a decade at this point. I said, what could you do for 10, 10 million bucks? And uh, David and Droga and, and the team came up with the Truth is Hard campaign. And that was the answer to the question. And that was an attempt to try in our own language. In, in a weird way... Historically, it's like the Times didn't have to do that, that people knew what it stood for and they liked it or didn't like it or like some of it didn't like it. But in this noisy, disrupted world, it yeah. seemed to make sense. We just Let's just say what we stand for, which, by the way, is not to say that we are the purveyors of truth. It's, that it's more to say that we take the time, and if you want to take the time... It's hard to get to the bottom of things. Yes. It's worth the effort. It's more about the, the kind of effort of reporting and the effort of turning to serious news is, is what it's about rather than claiming we're the truth and you're not sort of thing. No, but it, it is a responsibility that, yeah. that you have. Um, so it's a responsibility that we're all going to have to take a little bit more serious now, especially with GDPR, with a fine of like 4% of the company's turnover if anything goes slightly array. Um, <laughs> so, you know, fiscal responsibility yeah, is by something... By the way, the e-privacy the e regulations... Yes which could be a lot more draconian somewhere out there. I mean, GDPR is only the first boot. There's another boot to fall, possibly, anyway. So what we saw this afternoon, I don't, and I don't get jealous, we were looking at the LA Times, but this quite came up when we were looking for, uh, yeah, today. I oh, know, I oh, no. Do you believe it? I oh, know. <laughs> So this is, if anyone, don't, well, don't go rushing through to the LA Times right now. That's but what we call in my country belt and braces. It's like, you know, <laughs> they're not taking many chances no, at the LA exactly. Times, are they? <laughs> so my question, so as a I public... I would say live a little, I you know. know okay, hello. Just, <laughs> it's true. Have a look, Joanna. It's still there, right? So as a public company, how do you weigh up the risk? Um, you know, you have a lot of people working for you, um, delivering responsibly to well, I mean, your customers. If you go on the New York Times yeah. uh, website in, in, inside the, uh, the EEA, it's not just the EU. As you know, it's Liechtenstein and Iceland yes. uh, 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 and uh, Norway. Um, if you go on uh, the New York Times site in the EEA, you'll see a, a, a kind of cookie banner. Uh, 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 yeah. uh, it's not quite as draconian as that. But, 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 but this is some of your mates. I so mean, what I want to say good. more seriously... Uh, um, is 
I really think we're going to have to weigh every pixel on the site, every, every kind of transaction. Um, uh, I think the big platforms are going to have to get uh, 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 you know, again, sharper about us. We, 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 you know, we, I, I think it's we ask Google, you know, with DFP, you know, well, what about you just you you just using our, our users' data to to serve the ads for us and, and not you know using the data of anything else? And they said, well, DFP's not built that way. You know, it, it wasn't built that way. And and, yeah. and I think that all of us are going to have to be much more measured. Um, yes. You know, if if you think of this as being the public's money, its value, it's it's theirs. Yeah. And sure, you can get them to sign a waiver and get them to give it to you. But I think that well, that sense of responsibility. And I, you know, I looked at the the list of, as it were, third party sites that we were allowing to see use data in the in the Times in the context of Europe, which, as part of this, we have to disclose. And the first take, we've removed a lot of pixels. The first take was a pretty sobering and frightening yeah. read, actually. But if you look at the, the, what I mentioned earlier on, this, this, this bill that could be passed in November in California, which is like GDPR on steroids, apparently. So, uh, you know, and the, the US is always a little bit more thorough um, in how they pass bills and the way that they legislate. So, I mean, time will tell, but I mean, no, GDPR but, but I is not the, just the, Europe. The direction of travel is... is I mean, you know, we often um, uh, rail against government regulation. Yeah. This is in the consumer protection. Agreed. This is consumer protection regulation, and I have to say, we may well argue. We may well argue. Uh, probably want to argue about some of the details of the implementation, but the principle about there being tight controls on individual users and what happens to their data is very hard to argue against. Yes. Now, having said that, I, I also believe that consumers will want high-quality services. They will not want to get a subscription to everything. Yep. And I think it, as long as there is clarity and control uh, 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 of data, I still believe that there can, there can be a transaction where yes. users give us data and we give them something in, in return for that data. Yep. Um, so I don't, I don't believe the model needs to. Um, needs to but I, it's a bit like, you know, the Wild West being replaced by... You know, uh, at the end of the uh, 19th century, the 20th century, by the rule of law, yes. uh, in 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 the in the West of America, there comes a point where Dodge City has to uh, clean up its act, basically. Yeah, we have to take responsibility for our actions. Um, so let's talk a little bit about truth and justice and the role of your leadership. So your amazing team: Jody Cantor, Megan Tui, Emily, Emily Steele, Rebecca Corbett, and your entire gang. Um, revealed the truth about sexual harassment on a grand scale. Um, I read this at length, and I can't tell you how it made many of us feel. So the world... There's a, there's a great photograph, uh, uh, which uh, I think Jodie uh, put out on social media, which is uh, on Instagram, Instagram, I think. Um, and it's just a group of, of Times journalists. And it's the moment when somebody pressed publish on the... Weinstein story. Yeah, it's and I want to say there's one guy there, but the rest is uh, 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 kind of, it's a rather nice photograph of about you know six times women from behind it's all crouched oh, over the computer. Amazing. Yeah, it's, it's an amazing moment. So the world responded with a Pulitzer and a very well slight spattering of justice. There's still a lot more to be done. I know everyone would love to ask this question. So what was the process? I mean, you, you're responsible for the safety of your employees. You're responsible for their, you know, their professional conduct. How did this unravel? I mean, what was the excitement factor? How did you protect the team from the backlash and create a safe work environment while they were changing the world? Yeah, and, and, and in a way, something which in the end didn't matter uh, didn't matter at the time and doesn't matter, but uh, let me say it anyway. Um, Harvey Weinstein was one of the biggest biggest uh, advertisers in the New York Times. This is also a story about a major advertiser at the Times being the target of a very substantial New York Times investigation, a and rightly so. That's that's the way it works, and uh, and the fact that that that, that Weinstein spent so much money with us one way or another, was irrelevant to, to what happened. But that, that's something else to say. But that, that doesn't always happen. 
No, no, but our, our, our tradition is on that. There's an app. Not only is there a, a line, but frankly, I would say if you talk to Seb Tomey, the head of advertising, Mayor Kobit Levy, and the chief operating officer of me, we are 100% in favour of our journalism. And for our journalists, it's a free fire zone. It's a free fire zone. What, whatever. Uh, uh, they can do whatever they want. Um, well, look, the, the, it, it, the Emily Steele and Michael Schmidt had um, broken some months earlier the Bill O'Reilly harassment story. Uh, Emily will say to you the story always begins, this story, I mean, the story's an ancient story, but th this kind of wave of the story began with the Roger Ailes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and the question was, is, was Ailes a kind of one-off or was there more of a, a, a culture of harassment of Fox News? Yeah. But quite quickly, I want to say, and it's been, the story is still unfolding, each time you move the lens out and say, you know, so you say, well, is it just Fox News? Is it other journalistic organizations? Is it other media yeah. organizations? Uh, you know, what about the law? What about other industries? And each time we've done that, we, we found that, that, you know, it's prevalent. And I want to say, you don't meet, you don't meet women. Women may have different views about what should happen. Uh, and there's some variation between younger and older women about yeah. what should happen. You don't meet women who, who say, well, I, I don't know what they're talking about. I've never had an experience. Like, you just don't meet women who've had that experience. And I think that the kind of terrifying sense yes. of a completely hidden human experience involving essentially half the world's population, yeah. which is only now, only now, getting fully you know, exposed. Is kind of, but so, I mean, what happened is Emily figured out a way of using the fact of settlements... Yes. But, yeah. that, he yeah. said, she said, if he, it turns out, paid her millions of dollars for a kind of non-disclosure, suddenly the kind of balance of what's going on there, you know, uh, Mr. O'Reilly, there was a settlement to one claim of 32 million bucks. That's a lot of yeah. money to pay to a private individual when nothing happens. No, well. exactly. Like, you know, and like thinking <laughs> you can get away with it. <laughs> it's a, this is ridiculous. It's a great act of generosity if nothing happened. So, so, so she figured it out there. And then the Harvey Weinstein story, which had bubbled up before and which been, I want to be clear, we'd, we'd, we'd found it impossible to prove, to prove, became more, I mean, and there's this moment which Jodie Cantor talks about when, when uh, Ashley Judd, the actor, phoned Jodie and said... I've thought about it. They've been talking for months, I think. I've thought about it, and I want to go on the record. Yeah. And the, the, uh, it, the, these moments and the bravery of the, the, the witnesses, the, the women witnesses. I mean, what's interesting is uh, it's been very heartening is that the business of, of, of standing up and, and saying, it happened to me, became a little bit easier. And suddenly there was a flood of women who came forward and said, it happened to me. The first one or two deserve the Congressional Medal of Honor. I mean, yep. the first one or two just, it was, it, like, in, with Harvey, it changed in like three or four days. Yeah. And it was brilliant. You know, suddenly you had a kind of, you know, like an Oscar ceremony full of, 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 of women who, who said, well, but the first one or two, I just think is, inc and I think, you know, our, our, our women journalists were completely amazed at the courage of the people they talked to. So, so I mean, look, that costs money. Yes. It costs real money because it's months and months. Bill O'Reilly for Emily and Michael was seven months. Uh, probably Harvey, might, I'm guessing, something of the same order. Each one of these things take months. It costs money. And that's why getting the digital business model of the Times and other publishers right is so important. Because without professional journalists, this stuff wouldn't have come out. No, it wouldn't have come right. out. And the world would not be the way it is now. It would be like it was three or four years ago and the voices wouldn't be heard. So at the beginning, I said you've changed the lives of thousands of people off the pages of the Times. So thank you for that. So this is the end of the session. And thank you so much. Thank you for being an amazing, 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 empowering leader. And thank you for talking to us today. And I'm sure there's some, some questions from the audience, but we're running out of time. Do we have something after this? Yeah, we've got five minutes. So, I mean, I had 75 pages of questions. So I'm sure somebody's got some of those questions.
Thanks. Um, so my understanding is that uh, in the UK, uh, journalism often has more of a, a voice and a perspective that's kind of well understood. That you know, you're kind of there's more of a mixing of, of the uh, the actual uh, kind of breaking news and an actual kind of opinion or editorial on it. What, what are your thoughts on kind of the the, the merger of those? So. so What's interesting is there's, there's like two two traditions in the UK mm -hmm. that the newspapers have often been very opinionated, and although I think every newspaper would claim in the UK there's a, they think there's a difference between news and opinion, I think most American journalists would say those news stories look like they're coming from an ideological perspective. Mm -hmm. But in the UK, the public broadcasters, BBC and Channel Four, both of which I work for, have got a tradition of impartial news. And then they have kind of debate programs, which is much more like the American model. Right. So you're coming from that. And I, I, I yeah. come absolutely from that tradition. In fact, I mean, my view about impartiality is kind of beyond dry. It's absolute, you know, nobody should be able to tell which side, which, which side you vote for. And I essentially stopped voting when I was 21. Mm -hmm. So I, I never had to decide who to support, whatever. So I have an extreme view of try not to be influenced, try not to think of one side as being better than the other. Um, that's not quite the tradition of the Times and the other elite newspapers. but And I believe in labelling. I think people should be very clear uh, when they're looking at news and when they're looking at perspectives and opinions. Um, and I, I don't think we do a good enough job in digital at the Times. And I think we need to work with the big platforms to get that to work better. Hi, Joanne O'Connell Forrester. I'm writing about the future of omni-channel advertising and the consumer experience, which I think we've forgotten about in advertising. So how do you think about something like programmatic advertising today as compared with, say, three, four, or five years ago as a, as a publisher, as a premium publisher? So I, I, I would distinguish between kind of intentional programmatic, and I mean, a lot of our direct advertising is fulfilled through programmatic. I, I think generic programmatic advertising um, we use it with the with the, with the tail end of our inventory. I feel uncomfortable about it often. Uh, we try we we've artificially and at, at some economic loss raised the floor on pricing to try and we, we had a number of different tactics for trying to make sure that we we don't end up with shit. Uh, uh, um, well, you know we, we you know we're a quality brand. Our subscribers uh, who are paying a lot of money uh, are seeing the advertising. We want the advertising to be valuable. Uh, uh, and, and attractive and consistent with our content. So for us, uh, um, uh, uh, generic, uh, um, uh, as it were, programmatic advertising doesn't really make a lot of commercial sense, any more than in T Magazine. You know, we, we could get ads in T Magazine which would make a bit of money, but which we wouldn't feel comfortable with given the kind of the, the quality and the tone of the magazine. And more broadly, I want to say, I think for advertisers, you know, the world's leading brands need to think quite carefully. I mean, they went through a slightly mad phase of thinking that it, whatever, as long as you can reach the right person, it doesn't matter how or where. I think they're beginning to realize that seeing their, their brand on an extremist site and, or, or, or next to cheesy quality. And I think some of the big platforms, I mean, I, I think YouTube, Susan and the team at YouTube are trying really hard to work on quality at YouTube. But, you, you know, there is a price for being the world's biggest uh, repository of video of every size and shape, which, again, is you, you know, you're going to end up with some horrific adjacencies if you're not careful. So I think plenty of work to do on programmatic. At first sight, millennials don't read at all and then don't read the newspaper. So how do you transform them into loyal readers paying you for content? So it's really, it's really interesting, this. You know, we, we launched our, I, I think I said, we, we, we pick up, Partly because, actually, American millennials are getting really focused on politics and issues. We pick up 34 million millennials. About half of all millennials in the U.S. read the New York Times at least once a month is the kind of where we are. But our podcast, The Daily, which is a, it's a very human uh, piece of work, it, it's really about what it feels like to report one of these stories or to be one of the main, main characters. This has got a fantastically young audience. Uh, uh, um, I mean, we've got one and a half million regular daily listeners. This only started a year ago, still growing very quickly. And it's an amazingly young audience. I mean, a, a more than half is under the age of 40, more than a third is under the age of 30. And uh, as far as we can tell, we're engaging and they're listening to 20 minutes, 
20 minutes every day. And do you then transform the listeners to readers or do they remain well, listeners? I, I want to say, we're, you know, if you think of the funnel, we, we, I can't tell you exactly where that the, you know, the podcast is going to fit in the funnel. It's not at the bottom, though. It's somewhere at the top. It's about brand recognition. Uh, we, we know that some people do listen and then click through. But I want to be clear. I think the podcast is itself a piece of journalism and if the only thing people do is listen to our podcast, I think they are getting Times Journalism. Ditto, I hope, with the TV show. So, we're, we're, I mean, uh, the basic point is, and I think it's a, this is a life lesson. We learned it the hard way. It's a lesson for everyone. We have to go out and find our audience. We have to go out. We have to find the tactics. We have to find the weapons. We have to find the, the platforms, yeah. the devices. We have to go and find them. You know, you can't assume... Because you're a genius, they're going to come and find you. Life is too short now. You have to go and find them. Exactly. What a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Mark.